kamikaze. A terrifying weapon conceived in desperation. Japanese pilots committed to an unthinkable mission, a violent end as a human bomb. Now, through startling computer animation, an unprecedented view of these suicide attacks. On deck with horrified American sailors. And inside the kamikaze's cockpits, as suicide airplanes and rockets hurtle towards oblivion. Experience the battle. Dissect the tactics. Kamikaze, next on Dark Bites. October 25th, 1944, 10 a.m. Nine Japanese Zero fighters streak towards Leyte Gulf in the Philippines. The planes fly at wave top level to avoid detection by American radar. Theirs is a special mission, historic yet terrifying. It is the first organized kamikaze attack of World War II. Five of the Zeros carry a 550-pound bomb in place of the usual long-range fuel tank. The extra weight makes them unfit to dogfight. So four other Zeros fly escort. Japanese fighter ace Kunio Iwashita flew similar escort missions for kamikazes. <laughs> I was a fighter pilot, so my job was to accompany the kamikaze forces when they went on a mission and shoot down the Americans if they got in the way. Also, we were supposed to see what sort of results came from the kamikaze attacks, then report what we had seen back to base. Leading the suicide planes is Lieutenant Yukio Seki, his orders are to seek out the ships protecting the Allied invasion force on the Philippines, a small U.S. Navy task group called TAFI-3. Only hours before, these same vessels had come under withering gunfire from the Japanese Navy. The escort carrier USS St. Lo is one of the few ships of Tappy 3 not hit during the battle. Planes are now returning to St. Lo from the morning's combat and are quickly moved below decks for rearming and refueling. No one can imagine what is about to befall them. Orville Bethard is a 21-year-old electrician's mate on the St. Lo. I've never heard of a kamikaze. I've heard of bombers and all those kind of things, but somebody purposely uh, doing this didn't even occur to me. 10.45 a.m. The kamikazes spot the unsuspecting American ships. They climb quickly to 5,000 feet, positioning for a high-speed dive. The Japanese pilots select their targets, the vulnerable flight decks of the escort carriers. Escort carriers became the target of choice due to the fact that they had a thin wooden flight deck that could be penetrated by incoming kamikazes and their bombs. At 10.49, Lieutenant Seiki sees his opening. He rocks his wings to signal the attack. Diving on the USS White Plains, Seki is hit by flak and veers towards the St. Lowe. Well, we've been bombed before and everything, you know, all over this way, but this guy was low. 
that was heading for us like he was going to make a landing on our flight deck. Somebody behind me opened up with a 20 millimeter gun. And it may have hit him, but it didn't stop him. Captain Francis McKenna orders full right rudder, but the 10,000 ton vessel is slow to respond. This thing's doing 300 miles an hour, and he's coming in in a matter of seconds. Now, you can try to turn the ship, but there's not much you can do about it. At 10.53, Secchi sweeps in over the stern, then dives onto St. Lowe's flight deck. I didn't get the effect of the explosion, but I did get the fireball. And it come sweeping over my where I was located. I ducked real low, and it went skinning on over and out. Seki's armor-piercing bomb has sliced through the wooden flight deck and detonated below. What happens next is aircraft start exploding in the hangar deck, and each explosion begets another. One explosion will set off a torpedo over here. We'll set off um, some exposed fuel over here. And before you know it, half the hangar deck is ablaze. Men are burning. It's a horrific, frightening scene. Valiant crewmen try to contain the raging inferno. But just seven minutes after the first kamikaze hit, St. Lowe is in shambles. Captain McKenna orders the abandoned ship, at which point the lines go overboard and men start, start jumping into the sea, swimming away from the ship, trying to gain some distance before the ship goes down and sucks them under with it. At 11.20 a.m., an eighth explosion. The aircraft bomb magazine detonates, ripping apart the St. Lo. I could feel a big concussion from that in the water. And I turned around and I looked and I watched it then. The ship had turned about like that and was going down stern first. I don't know how many live people were still on there. And I was thinking, well, I was thinking there goes my home. At 11.25, the once proud ship slips beneath the surface. Of a crew of over 850, 114 are lost. USS St. Lo is the first American ship sunk by kamikazes. A hideous scenario that will be repeated nearly 3,000 times before the war's end claiming 5,000 lives. The idea for suicide attacks was first considered nearly 20 months earlier, in the wake of Japan's humiliating loss of Guadalcanal in February 1943. The kamikaze program was born of desperation when they realized that there was not much they could do against the overwhelming strength being deployed by the Americans. That wasn't much they could do in the, in the conventional, traditional sense. The concept was originally rejected as defeatist. But with the Allied invasion of the Philippines, the decision is made to unleash the suicide weapon. The goal is to inflict sufficient casualties to destroy the Americans' will to fight. The new strategy is called TOKO. They refer to the tactic as tokubetsu kogeki, uh, which means uh, literally translated special attack. Vice Admiral Takajiro Onishi is charged with implementing toko operations immediately. He enlists volunteers from the 201st Naval Air Group in the Philippines. There's no time for specialized training. Many of the first volunteers are dive bomber pilots. It is hoped that their experience in near vertical dives will translate into the TOKO mission. The high command understands that turning sons of Japan into human bombs will have to be carefully sold to the people. 
they skillfully manipulate Japan's ancient history to envelop Toko in the idealized warrior tradition of the samurai and their Bushido code. In the so-called code of the warrior or Bushido, there was no tradition or heritage of organized suicide tactics. If there was any kind of codification of suicide in this so-called Bushido, it was to kill yourself rather than being captured. Uh, there was never anything in it about uh, making a suicide attack. The success of the initial kamikaze mission on October 25, 1944, unleashes a tidal wave of attacks. Navy and Army High Command draft inexperienced pilots into practically any flyable airplane. By the time of the Okinawa invasion in April 1945, massive kamikaze raids are bringing a glimmer of hope to Japan's desperate situation. It spreads the idea that a single man, a single aircraft, can trade itself for a U.S. carrier, which is truly a glorious sacrifice for the emperor. April 16, 1945, the destroyer USS Laffey, accompanied by support ships LCS-51 and 116, is patrolling waters 50 miles north of Okinawa. The ship is on radar picket duty, a new defensive tactic that positions a ring of destroyers around the main invasion force to create an early warning system against incoming aircraft. Laffey is manning station number one, the closest to Japan. The last four destroyers to patrol this area were slammed by kamikazes. Ari Futridis is a 19-year-old quartermaster on Laffey. We knew that being the first in the line of defense was, was uh, dangerous, but we didn't realize to what extent. At 7.44 a.m., radar picks up a solitary Val dive bomber six miles out, approaching off the port bow. Laffey's five-inch guns quickly open fire. At three miles, the Val jettisons its bomb and turns away. Probably came in just to look over the situation and, and then took off. Then, at 8.29 a.m., a swarm of 50 Japanese planes appears on the horizon. The attackers circle ominously, like vultures. The USS Laffey is about to face the most unrelenting kamikaze attack in history. April 16, 1945, 50 kamikazes surround the destroyer USS Laffey. The swarm includes Val and Judy dive bombers and Kate torpedo planes. Older aircraft equipped for suicide attack. These were outmoded aircraft. They could be loaded with explosives. They were relatively easy to fly and stable platforms for doing what they had to do, which is to aim at a ship and try to, try to hit it. Al Doris watches the terrifying procession from his 40 millimeter gun mount. Well, there was just about every place you looked. You know, you could see a Japanese plane. Suddenly, four valves break formation and bear down on Laffey. They were coming in low on the water, and somebody on our gun said, well, here they come. They're, they're coming now. Two head for the starboard bow. Captain Julius Becton orders Laffey to come about hard left 30 degrees to bring all his guns broadside to the attackers. Laffey unleashes an anti-aircraft barrage. First, the main battery, 
five inch radar directed guns. And then they get in a little closer than the 40s. And they get a little closer, then the 20 millimeters will start rattling at him. We just try to stop them as best we could. Laffy splashes the first two attackers, but the other two valves wheel around to come in from the stern. One valve sheds pieces of fuselage until its fixed landing gear catches the water. Tracers converge on the second valve. Laffy is barely spared a moment's respite before a Judy screams in from 90 degrees to starboard. Judy's are a fast dive bomber, top speed 340 miles per hour. But this one's heading in at a poor attack angle. All of Laffy's guns can train their fire on the kamikaze. But immediately, another Judy barrels in on the opposite side. The destroyer's top speed is 35 knots, and it can turn sharply. Captain Beckton orders 30 degrees hard right rudder. This diving Judy was also strafing with its guns, trying to take out personnel on the command bridge. And so we had briefly a two-way gunnery duel between an oncoming kamikaze and the defending gunners. The Judy is no match for Laffey's main battery. The aircraft disintegrates, but its bomb detonates in the water, spewing killing shrapnel over exposed areas of the ship. Planes are coming in from every angle, using specialized tactics developed over months of experience. A kamikaze attack isn't exactly an easy thing to do. You have about 500 kilos of explosives on board, and you are going at exceedingly fast speeds from very high up. To actually hit the target, it's very difficult. The Japanese have determined that the most effective attacks are from extremely high or extremely low angles. In the high angle attack, the kamikazes approach at 20,000 feet, angle 20 degrees down to 5,000 feet, then a steep 50 degree high speed dive. For the low angle attack, the kamikazes approach below 40 feet to hide under radar. When they near the target, the pilot pulls up to 1,500 feet for the final plunge, relying on speed and gravity to reach the target, even if his aircraft is hit. The ideal TOKO mission can muster enough kamikazes to use all approach tactics together. Precisely what Laffey is facing now. At 8.39 a.m., a Val approaches from the port side, directly amidships. Laffey maneuvers violently to throw off the pilot's aim. Laffey now presents a smaller target. The ship is 377 feet long, but only 41 feet wide. This did have an effect, apparently, on the Val pilot because he was having to constantly change his aim in order to keep his aircraft heading for the mass of the ship. Eventually, because of the swing of the Laffey, the Val was now coming in from almost dead astern. It's as if Laffey is in a dogfight with the Kamikaze. Triple A hits home. But the Val's momentum carries him in. It's a glancing blow, but the plane's ruptured gas tanks spew a lethal arc of combustible fuel. Then a ninth kamikaze bores in. 
the bell approaches at wave top level, too low an angle for the main gun battery. The plane rips into a 20 millimeter gun mount amidships, killing three men. Another Val approaches dead astern, obscured by the billowing smoke. The carnage reaches below decks. Crewmen enveloped in flames race topside. Sailors aboard LCS-51 steaming nearby witness the terrible scene. Several men who were working below decks came roaring out of there and jumped over the side, just little flames, and we picked two of them up. It was, it was nasty, it was nasty. At 8.47, 17 minutes into the attack, gun mount 53 takes a direct hit. Val's engine lodges in the five-inch gun, knocking it out. Aviation fuel engulfs the gun mount and ignites. There were 14 men inside that gun mount at that time, and six of them were killed. It seemed like a constant pattern of attack. In fact, at one point, I remember thinking to myself, my God, will this never end? In the furious action, one of the kamikazes swings past the Laffy and targets LCS-51, steaming off the port side. One of the planes came in maybe 10 feet off the water. And of course, our guns on that side of the ship were all awning. Some of us, one of us, hit the bomb about 20, 30 feet from the ship. The bomb detonated and blew the plane to smithereens, the engine right into the side of our ship. My spotter, who was in with the director tub with me, put his arm up to shield his face. He put his arm up and was all over. He had three or four aluminum rivets in his arm that came from the plane. Back on Laffey, Fires are blazing on the fantail. Captain Beckton is forced to cut his speed. If you run too fast, you're going to fan the flames and make them stronger. But if you go too slow, then the enemy's going to be able to hit you better. So what he would do, he would slow down so they could fight the fire. And as the enemy got closer, he would increase his speed. But another Val is lining up high astern, drawn to the raging fires like a shark to blood. The ship takes evasive action and swings hard to port. This Val is making a bomb run. Kamikaze formations were often accompanied by conventional bombers. A single 500-pound bomb hits the destroyer, jamming the rudder 26 degrees to port. Having the rudders jam permanently in this location meant that the ship could only steam in a left-hand circle. Captain Beckton could come up with variations such as changing engine speed in order to broaden or tighten the turn, but still, this was a severe limitation on his defensive abilities. Fires are raging. Steering is damaged. Laffey is fading fast. April 16, 1945. USS Laffey is being hammered by a swarm of 50 kamikazes. Now, four FM-2 Wildcats from Navy Squadron BC-94, flying off the carrier Shamrock Bay, are vectored in to try to save the ship. Flight leader Carl Riemann has witnessed other kamikaze attacks and understands the urgency of his mission. I've seen them come down and hit the different ships 
And boy, I'm telling you, when they hit a ship, she blew. Riemann wings in and sizes up the situation. The odds are 50 against four. The FM2s only carry 1,600 rounds of ammo, about 45 seconds worth. His big enemy is the time. How is it going to be well managed so that he gets bullets on target, does not waste bullets, does not waste energy? Riemann must use the speed and agility of the FM2 to counter the long odds. The FM2 is an updated version of the venerable F4F Wildcat. The new airplane has a more powerful 1260 horsepower engine. It can easily outfly the obsolete planes attacking the Laffey. Riemann and his wingman, Dick Collier, climb 500 feet above the kamikaze formation, target a Val, and quickly dive in from the side. Riemann hurtles in, aiming his 450 caliber machine guns. But his wingman unknowingly drifts into the line of fire. Collier, he was right on my wing, and he got in between us. So uh, I couldn't shoot after that, because I'd have shot Collier. Collier gets the kill. Riemann quickly lines up behind another valve, opens fire, and explodes the enemy's wing tanks. We were on so fast, they didn't have time to really do anything. They had no place to go, except down. There are still over 40 kamikazes attacking Laffey. The massive formations ensure some suicide planes will get through. It's like a swarm of mosquitoes. You can kill a lot of them, you can kill them easily, but there are enough mosquitoes, one's going to bite you. Horrified at the carnage below, Riemann singles out a kamikaze for payback. His tracers light up the enemy's canopy, killing the pilot. I watched him just slump over and bing, and he went. These kamikaze pilots are little more than trainees. Most of Japan's experienced aviators have been lost during three years of war. They were given two days of takeoff training, two days of formation flying, and three days of actually how to dive in to destroy an enemy ship. These kids have been trained for a week, and now they're going out there, and they're basically becoming a human bomb. Two kamikazes break through the fighter screen and pitch over into a death dive on the Laffey. Well, when they got in close enough, you could see the pilot sitting right in the cockpit. And he's not looking one way or the other. He's looking right straight ahead. And he's aiming that plane right at you. You can't imagine what goes through what goes through somebody's mind that does that. Both planes hit their mark. Pressing the attack, Riemann sweeps behind a Cape torpedo plane and smokes the engine. but he's used the last of his ammo. Well, if I'd had more ammo, I could have shot down more airplanes. Being the vernacular, I was just totally pissed off. Because <laughs> there was a lot more to shoot at. Riemann makes diving passes at kamikazes, forcing some to break off their attacks. 
finally low on fuel, his flight must return to the Shamrock Bay. We shot down six airplanes, and we had six airplanes that didn't hit the Laffey. And we were just only sorry we couldn't keep all of them off of it. She was burning, burning bad. I thought she was gone. Laffey has now been struck by five kamikazes and taken three bomb hits. The skipper sent me down to get an assessment of the damage back aft. And then I saw what these planes had done. I saw the gun mounts. I saw that there were fires. I saw a lot of human carnage. Uh, I think I might have been in a state of shock. Uh, when you see things like that. When a crewman suggests throwing in the towel, Captain Beckton responds with indignation. I will not abandon ship as long as a single gun can fire. Then, just as all seems lost, a dozen American Corsair fighters roar in. They are the last hope for the burning laughing. USS Laffey has taken repeated kamikaze hits. And at least 30 Japanese planes are still waiting to pounce. Now, not a moment too soon, Marine Corps F-4U Corsairs scream in. We looked up and saw them. Well, that took a lot off of us because they kept them busy from then on. The F-4U Corsair was one of the most advanced naval fighters of the Pacific War. Its distinctive bent wing derived from the clearance needed from its huge 13-foot propeller. The shape also reduced aerodynamic drag. Corsair had a clear advantage over any Japanese aircraft. High speed, tough, very maneuverable, take a lot of punishment. Time and again, the Corsair pilots risk their own lives, chasing the kamikazes down through Laffey's unceasing anti-aircraft fire. One is hot on the tail of a KI-43 Oscar. This Japanese plane was coming in, and they get Corsair come up underneath of it. Tried to raise him up to get him away from the ship. The Oscar shears off the port yard arm. The Corsair hits the ship's radar antenna and careens away, badly damaged. The courageous American pilot manages to bail out. Suddenly, a bow looms menacingly towards the bridge, Ari Fotridi's battle station. It was very vivid in my mind. There was a huge bomb under his belly. And as he approached, the bomb got bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and I really felt at that point that that was going to be a statistic. But at the last second, gun mount 52 traverses from port to starboard. He hit the, the plane directly on the nose and it disintegrated. That I remember very vividly. Finally, the 22nd and last attacker, a Judy, streaks in. The Corsair blasts the kamikaze before it could strike the ship. Now, only the roar of the Corsair's 2,000 horsepower engines fill the sky. After 80 minutes of non-stop combat, six kamikaze strikes and four bomb hits, incredibly, Laffey is still afloat. 
of a crew of 355, 32 men have died and 71 more are wounded. But the destroyer will survive to fight another day. I lost a lot of good friends and a lot of the guys were wounded and, and it was, made you think how lucky you were not to get a scratch. I think there were several factors involved in our survival. I always point to the competency of our commanding officer and the way he maneuvered the ship during the attack. There was the combat air patrol, which helped us out. Our crew it was a brave crew, especially the gunners. And finally, I am convinced in my own mind that uh, we had a little help from above. The Okinawa campaign saw many brutal kamikaze raids of the type endured by Laffey. It also marked the brief appearance of the most insidious suicide weapon of World War II, called Oka. April 12, 1945, radar picket station 14 off Okinawa. Destroyer Mannert L. Abeli is battling fires after being hit by a zero kamikaze. The plane went through the deck and down and broke both our shafts, our screws on the ship, which put us about dead in the water. Just five minutes after the kamikaze strike, three Japanese Betty bombers are spotted inbound from the north at 20,000 feet. What the Americans don't know is that suspended within the open bomb bay of each Betty is an appalling new suicide weapon. A single seat rocket powered piloted bomb developed by the Japanese Navy. It's called Oka or Cherry Blossom. The Americans derisively nicknamed the weapon Baka or Idiot. But they will discover to their horror that the piloted missile is virtually unstoppable. April 12, 1945. Three Betty bombers carrying Oka Kamikaze rocket planes approach the crippled destroyer Mannert L. Abeli. Inside one of the bombers, Lieutenant Saburo Dohi is awakened from a nap and climbs down into the Oka's cockpit. The human guidance system is now in place. The Oka is released. Its plunge begins as an unpowered glide. One minute from impact, Lieutenant Dohi kicks in his solid rocket boosters. The Oka makes its final sprint to the Aboli at over 500 miles per hour. Able seaman Jim Morris spots something he's never seen before. Somebody said, look at that, and I look up, and that's when I saw the Baca bomb coming in. It was coming in from our starboard quarter, and I watched that rascal. I didn't, to me, it looked like a flying torpedo. I had no idea what it was. The destroyer's five-inch mounts can't move. 40-millimeter and 20-millimeter guns open fire at the mysterious incoming object. The ship's midsection is obliterated. When it hit, that whole ship just shook all over. And that's when I went over the side. It went down in two pieces. The stern came down and the bow came down, like that. Within three minutes, Mannert L. Abeli vanishes. 79 men are lost. The Oka has left its murderous calling card. The piloted bomb program, known as the Divine Thunder God Corps, 
was approved by the Japanese Navy in August 1944. Newly minted pilot Hideo Suzuki was asked to volunteer. The commander described the weapon as most innovative, most powerful, and damaging, but requires our absolute sacrifice. I knew all along that a death awaits war-going pilots one way or another. If my trusted commander is asking for men, then I will volunteer. The Oka is ingeniously simple. Aluminum fuselage, wooden wings, and directly in front of the pilot, 2,600 pounds of high explosive, five times the amount carried by the Zero that sank the St. Low. Each Oka volunteer is allowed one risky orientation flight in an unpowered, unarmed Oka. First, I fell just like a bomb, and I had to gain momentum before the flight controls would operate and I could start flying. The training Oka had no rockets, so we had to glide in. In a real operation, I would fire three rockets to strike the target. Having survived his training drop, Suzuki is ready to fulfill his destiny. If I am to die, I will die the most effective, most glorious death by inflicting the greatest damage on our enemy. Not far from the Abelian, another of Suzuki's cohorts hurtles towards the picket destroyer USS Stanley. On board the ship, Radar operator Irvin Brewer spots the strange flying object. It was on the deck when I saw it. I mean, it was right off the water, just as low as it could get. I just hit the deck and started praying. The Oka impacts the starboard bow, five feet above the waterline. I don't know if I saw it the instant it hit, but I sure as hell felt it. The missile's armor-piercing nose section punches right through Stanley's steel bow plates and out the other side. They plotted that thing at 500 miles an hour, and we knew it had to be some jet-propelled thing because, I mean, we didn't have anything to go that fast. Within minutes, another Oka bores in. Stanley's guns are blazing. The pilot, perhaps wounded or killed, releases pressure on the stick for a brief instant. The Oka rises slightly, just enough to miss the ship. Unlike the Abele, the Stanley suffers only minimal damage with three crewmen wounded. Ultimately, the Oka program never lived up to its lethal potential. The bomber transports were easy prey for American fighters, and only seven American ships were damaged by Okas during the war. Hideo Suzuki was never selected for his glorious death. Although the kamikazes arrived too late to be militarily significant, they exacted a terrible cost. Some 2,800 kamikaze attacks killed nearly 5,000 Americans and wounded 4,800 more. Ominously, Japan had reserved more than 5,000 suicide aircraft to be used against the expected invasion of the home islands, a gruesome scenario that would have magnified the immense human toll of the Kamikaze.